Hi. Um, can everyone hear me all right? I'm guessing so. Okay, cool. Um, I'm Chris Sumner, joined here today by uh, Randall Wald, who's uh, going to be focusing on some uh, data science machine learning. Probably kill me for saying data science. Um, and our talk is on predicting susceptibility to social bots on, uh, on the Twitter platform. So a, a quick intro into how I got into all of this. Um, maybe about 10 years ago, uh, a friend of mine back in the UK said, hey Chris, you can make money on horse racing because now you can bet against horses. And here's me thinking, well, okay, um, betting against horses, that's got to be pretty easy, right? You know, so you just pick the one that looks least likely to win, bet against it, and watch the money roll in. So, but it turns out it's not quite that simple, actually. But uh, that's how I got into sort of looking at data analytics and machine learning to see how can I reduce the odds of the bank blowing up in horse racing. And then in terms of social media a few years ago, uh, I got involved in a little project with, um, with the US skateboarder Tony Hawk hiding skateboards around the place. And I wanted to see how that would map out and who spoke to who on Twitter regarding that competition. So a sort of an interest in could I beat the, improve the odds in horse racing and the social network side kind of came together. And um, from that, formed a, a small charity called the Online Privacy Foundation where we focus really on what's called behavioral residue research, which is looking at what people give away without knowing it in terms of their, their personality. So with that said, and this being uh, Vegas and all, one thing I wanted to be sure of um, in this presentation, if you're expecting sort of laser accuracy in terms of predicting people who are going to respond to a social bot, that's not going to be the case. We're really just focusing on improving the odds over a random chance. Um, so if you're expecting laser accuracy, you may be a trifle disappointed. So anyway, with, with that said, I just wanted to sort of lay the limitations down. Has anybody, is anybody familiar with this guy? Tim Huang, yeah, that is, um, and Tim Huang, um, this is how I got interested in social bots really. Found out that he ran a, a competition back in 2011 uh, called the Social Bots Competition. Um, essentially what that, what that consisted of was they set up uh, a target group of people on Twitter who had some interest in sh talking about cats, cat related kitten stuff. Um, and he set those up as targets and invited people to build social bots and come join the competition. And there were three teams that, um, that competed in that competition and they, they got, their bots were able to gain the points and they were able to gain points like plus one if they got a follow back, three if they were able to get some social interaction and they would dock 15 points but they could respawn if they were killed by Twitter and that's basically suspended by, by Twitter. And it was described as uh, blood sport for internet social science and network analysis nerds. And if you're not familiar with it, it there's yeah, a couple of really neat videos online. I put them in the speaker notes so you can go and find them uh, all about the competition. But that was kind of, that was interesting. And the winning bot was able to get almost 40% um, social response or some, some, some form of response, 198 out of, out of 500 responses by a chap called uh, at Aerofade on, on Twitter at least, um, uh, a guy from New, New Zealand. So with that, most of the research to date is really focused on how do you detect spam bots in social networks or spam bots in, in general, but far less research in looking at um, human behavior in relation to, you know, so the other side of the equation, human, re human behavior in relation to social bots. So last year when we did some research looking at psychopathy and other personality traits, I might add, on, on Twitter, at the same time, that was kind of when we were thinking about the social bots thing, we thought actually it'd be neat if we could encourage some folks to participate in a further research project where they'd receive uh, an unsolicited tweet but not necessarily know when that tweet would be or who it would be from. So we were able to get out of the 3,000 odd people that took part in the, um, the sort of psychopathy dark triad research, a subset of that users, those users took part, um, volunteered in this because we had two questions. 
One being uh, some users more naturally predisposed to interacting with strangers online. I use strangers because you could argue that a social bot is the same as like, interacting with a stranger online. And also, is it possible to increase the odds of getting a response from uh, a Twitter user? With the main goal of avoiding uh, Twitter jail, essentially. So, a reasonable question at this point is really who cares? Um, if you're not familiar with this dude, it was different strokes. It's like meant a lot to me in my childhood. Um, well, in terms of who cares, uh, marketeers possibly care. Um, the game used to be for marketeers to really get like likes and you know follows and stuff like that, but it's shifting now to more engagement. So they're being gold more on engagement rather than just getting likes and follow count. So they may be interested in gaming the system because there's money at stake and where there's money. Um, you get the idea. Uh, the next uh, group that might be interested in exploiting this would be propagandists who have got some message to try and get out um, or change subtly some form of message. And we'll talk more about these in, in detail as well. The next group would be uh, social engineers who are maybe trying to find the most likely person or my, most likely sort of fishing victim in, a, in an organization and try and target them rather than the people who are less likely to respond in the first place. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the slides to come. In terms of online privacy, this was kind of where I was scratching my head for a little while earlier in the year. Um, there's a chap called Erhard Graef out of, out of uh, MIT uh, he's got a really neat paper, if you've not seen it, called uh, What Should We Do Before the Social Bots Take Over? Online Privacy Protection and the Political Economy of Our Near Future. And one of the um, things he mentions in that paper is that if humans are interacting with social bots and they don't know they're social bots, they may give away more information than they would if they knew it was like an automated account. So it may encourage them to do, do riskier behavior, maybe share personal details over direct messages in Twitter, for example, or uh, you know, I am or whatever it's called in, in Facebook. So it's a neat paper. If you've not seen it, it's, uh, it's well worth having a read. And the final group that have got some interest in this whole field, uh, social network providers themselves. Um, and, uh, the, I can't recall exactly what the paper was where, where the cartoon was from, but it's, it's a pretty funny one with lots of robot cartoons. But, so Facebook, for example, have got Facebook immune system, um, and it's this sort of constant revolving battle over them. It, it, improving their algorithms to detect bot and bot-like behavior, um, and you know, then the bot creators getting a, an advantage and so on and so forth. They're actually pretty good. And Twitter have been doing, I guess, something uh, similar because you can see the way that they've tackled uh, spam bots really uh, was, was pretty effective at least a few years ago. Um, so we set to work in uh, building some bots to, uh, to actually analyze this for ourselves. So in terms of the rest of the talk, how it will go down, essentially is we'll look at the, the history and sort of current research of social bots. So if you're intimately familiar with Tim Huang, this next 10 minutes may be a little bit light for you. Then we'll talk about the experiment and the method, uh, talk about the, the findings, and uh, wrap up with some conclusions. So for social uh, bots, there's an interesting working definition by a group of researchers from uh, Austria called um, Wagner and, uh, and company. Um, a social bot is a piece of software that controls a user account in an online social network and passes itself off as a human. So we could debate that, but it, it, it's good enough. You can also hear social bots may be described as, as uh, sibyls. Um, it's not quite the, the, not quite the case, but it's, it's probably good enough. And that was a phrase coined in 2002 by John Deuser at Microsoft Research. Uh, that's also a pretty, uh, pretty interesting paper that he, he wrote there. Then you can argue that social bots aren't nothing new and you'd be right in doing that. There's at least a paper in 94 that talked about chat bots on tiny muds and what have you. Um, and there's probably stuff before then. So, okay, let's take a look at some of the sort of the historical developments. You've got um, popularity initially. This is where people were getting lots of fake followers and that was what people were going for. I mentioned rather than engagement, people were going for likes. So that was an obvious, rather trivial one. 
Um, the next one, which you kind of see a little bit less of these days, is just the Twitter spam that you'd get. If you mention anything, all of a sudden, you know, there'd be um, talking about, you know, diet products, which I haven't, haven't tried myself, evidently. Um, some Twitter bots are actually pretty amusing. So this was a guy, he says, uh, I don't know how you can read this, if this is sufficiently clear from the back of the room, but had a successful auction yesterday, thank you, universe. To which the universe replied, uh, no problem, Kevin, get out there and do your thing. And there's a bunch of these sort of bots out there. Uh, you know, there's one that I'm particularly sad to have seen gone, which was, um, I think, it, excuse the French, but the world of shit bot was, so every time you mentioned Full Metal Jacket, it would give you grief over, uh, over Twitter. And I, I'm kind of sad that that doesn't do that anymore. But There's another guy here, Nigel Leck, I think in Australia, might be New Zealand. He got tired of debating climate change deniers, so he built a bot that would go and point climate change deniers to research that showed the other side of that argument. Uh, unfortunately, that's been shut down uh, as well, but that was a pretty am amusing you know, piece of work they had done there. In terms of like, exploring social bots on Twitter, this was arguably one of the, the first pieces to work there by a uh, guy called Greg Mara, who uh, created this real, real boy project, which had a bunch of bots that used different, different ways of actually approaching how you create a social bot, maybe taking posts from other users and then reposting them somewhere else in another part of the social graph. Um, that's, again, that's pretty interesting stuff to look at. So it brings me to uh, politics, and I don't know if anybody was in the, uh, the Maltigo talk that just preceded this, but um, Rulof um, Tamingi, you know, I'm, I've failed at the name, I practiced that with Rulof just like an hour ago, but um, Rulof and Kenneth Gears, they wrote a paper in 2009 called Virtual Plots and Real Revolutions. Um, where one of the things they stated here was, for example, in the week before an election, what if both left and right wing blogs were seeded with false but credible information about one of the candidates? Could tip the balance in a close race. And then a year later, there was um, a US uh, election between Martha Coakley and Scott Brown, where um, a bunch of Twitter bots sprung up to discredit uh, Martha Coakley. Um, it's a kind of a, a groundswell, if you like. And that resulted, or at least the result was that Scott Brown won. Whether there was a, a link between that actually happening is, is probably debatable, but that actually happened. Um, and there's a term for that as well. Um, it's called swift boating. I took the idea of the Taylor Swift thing from a rather excellent Twitter presentation I saw at OWASP. Um, so if there's anyone from Twitter, thanks for the idea. Um, there's another side to that as well is paying people to, um, or creating bots, and in this case it was um, the Russian elections where people were paid to create um, positive information about, um, about uh, Putin essentially. So you could use social bots in the context of actually drumming up support for political candidates. Uh, and that's got a term as well called astroturfing and the whole point or the reason for that name is that astroturfing is a ground roots, um, a ground roots campaign and it feels like a ground, ground, grassroots uh, campaign. In terms of identifying whether grassroots campaigns are fake or real, uh, a project sprung up from Indiana University called the Truthy Project, where they look at um, not just uh, well grassroots campaigns, but also internet memes and things that are going viral, and look at where they start and see, to some degree, whether they've been you know created by uh, fake accounts or real accounts. Then back in. Uh, I can't remember, was it 2011, the H.B. Gary incident where the, the emails were exposed. They exposed some emails talking about uh, the United States military looking at fake personas termed sock puppets, um, you know, and con controlling those. And those could be used, for example, in, um, there was some mention in the press about those being used in like the Arab Spring, for example. Um, which is interesting because that's one of the things that Ruloff and Kenneth Gears in their 2009 paper had suggested, that a large virtual population uh, scattered all over the world and encompassing different socio-economic backgrounds 
could be programmed to support any personal, social, business, political, military or terrorist agenda. So their paper, although it was in 2009, you know, we were seeing bits of that sort of come out in, in reality. One of the final things I wanted to mention was something that caught my attention around sort of Christmas time, was that uh, um, you've got this uh, service provider in the UK, a telecom service provider called EE, um, and they were coming out with tweets like this to their users who were complaining with, I don't know, service disruption or whatever. Please follow and DM your mobile number, postcode, and password. So obviously DMing passwords is fine because, you know, it's, who sees DMs? But the interesting thing was, this was picked up by um, a guy called Troy Hunt, who has got a, a, an excellent blog post on the topic. And he was just talking about the, the DM password issue. But what we noticed then was that um, this other account came, uh, came up, My EE Care, um, and they came up with a sort of innocuous uh, tweet about can you link us to your post once it's done. But if you followed their tweets afterwards, then they got, you know, there was some interaction saying it's good to see EE doing something positive about that. And they were like, no, we don't really care. Um, but it wasn't EE that was sending that message. It was the My EE Care who were a fake account. So it raises the possibility that if you get in there quick, if somebody's not got a social presence, an organization hasn't got a social presence, and you can get in there quicker, um, then you could use social bots to interact with those humans and get them to send you information that they would probably send their service provider because they're used to this sort of stuff from a legitimate service provider, but send it to a fake account. So back to Tim Huang, after the social bots competition that he did in 2011, uh, they set up this organization called uh, uh, Pacific Social. And one of the reasons why they were interested in, uh, one of the things they wanted to do at Pacific Social was really look at um, social, the social graph and how that could be distorted. So if you look on the left-hand side image, that was the social graph before the social bots competition, 500 interconnected users. But the distorted graph on the right hand side is the, the graph two weeks after the competition. So they were really interested by the way that that was distorted by the three, bo the three bots. There were the red, blue, and green dots in the middle. Because they were interested in something called like social bridge building, essentially whether they could get two disparate um, social groups on a social network and get them to begin interacting and start stitching those networks together or also find places where there were social interactions before, um, look where they've dropped and then, um, and then begin mending those. You know, maybe you've not spoken to somebody for a while and you need to you know, bring them together. So they were kind of interested in that. And if anybody's seen Tim's uh, Hope 9 talk, he also talked about the concept of emotional contagion or happiness buffering. And the concept of that really was that you take a group of, of people um, and you seed that group with, uh, with some bots and you monitor that with some basic sen sentiment analysis. And you find that when happiness in certain um, members of that social group dips below a certain level, then you can start injecting happy, happy information into that social network or more positive tweets into that, that network. So what they were exploring was whether you could then actually turn some of the unhappy people into uh, happy campers, essentially. So that's, where, that's one of the things they're working on. I don't think they've, they've concluded that. But it's kind of an interesting concept which comes from you know, sort of social interaction and the effect that has on many things like obesity, for example. There's a, a, a chap that's written a great book called Connected, uh, Krista Kiss, I think is his surname. Um, and uh, that's not been researched that much on social networks right now, but uh, it's certainly a topic that's it's pretty interesting. Tim had also mentioned uh, social penetration testing and, and what he was suggesting was that if you can spread information with small inaccuracies and then see where those inaccuracies are challenged or they're not challenged, then identify out of the group that doesn't challenge them who's the most influential but also the worst at evaluating what's real and target them with your information and get them to, to tweet stuff out. So a bunch of interesting things coming out of the work of Tim Huang and, uh, and those guys. And then there's this chap here, Yazan Boshmaf at University of British Columbia. Um, who rose to some, some fame or infamy um, because he created social bots on Facebook. 
and was, I guess, accused in the press of stealing 250 gigabytes of data. Well, that gets back to the Erhard Graef paper, the MIT paper, about one of the online privacy uh, issues of uh, social bots. Because people were interacting with somebody they thought was a human, they were then exposing their information to uh, a broader audience, um, and maybe some of that information wouldn't necessarily have been publicly available in the Facebook, um, in the Facebook I don't know, uh, graph. So one of the things that he cites in his paper in 2012 was that really understanding the factors that influence user decisions on befriending strangers is like a key, uh, a key goal, which would be useful for designing user-centered security controls that better communicate the risks of online threats. That was one of his uh, discussion points in, in the paper. So I spoke with um, Yazan Boshmaf about, you know, about this to, you know, to some degree. And in relation to that, there are two uh, groups that are studying, uh, understanding user behavior in terms of security. One of them is the Secure and Trustworthy Cyberspace Initiative um, out here in the US, um, mainly academia and corporations working together. And another is uh, centered in the University of Oxford in the UK, um, and that's called the Insider Threat Project. And both of those have identified that understanding user behavior is one of the, you know, one of the critical, one of five critical questions to actually look at. So with that, we wanted, to find, we wanted to embark on some research that had essentially find people that will talk with anyone about anything and find some guinea pigs to do that. So that's kind of a whirlwind history. And in the slide notes, there'll be a lot more material on where you can go and find like pointers to the research that I mentioned and, and videos and whatnot. So in terms of our methodology, we... Uh, started off with 610 uh, participants that were a subset of the folks that had um, participated in the research we did looking at dark triad personality traits. Those people gave us um, a personality inventory which looked at uh, the big five personality traits of uh, extroversion, openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, and um, neuroticism or emotional stability depending on which school of thought you're from. Uh, the Twitter information, so, um, you know, sort of biography length, number of friends and followers, that kind of thing. Uh, linguistic analysis of their tweets, um, of which there were, you know, roughly 3,000 for each individual, and their clout score. We divided those 610 people into two groups of 305, just to speed up processing a little bit, really, and assigned them each a, uh, a social bot. Taking from the Web Ecology Project, we wanted to mirror the Web Ecology Project's bots as closely as possible, and because their code was available online, we, uh, we, used their, we reused their code, slightly repurposed it. So our social bot was a dear old lady who had a biography of I've got all my own teeth. Um, and to set this old lady's profile up, um, there were two old ladies like that, the first thing we did, and this came from the Web Ecology Project again, was that they'd take postings from Flickr groups. In the Web Ecology um, Project, it was uh, kittens, we used dogs, and there was a bit of code that would post a, a WordPress post and then a WordPress to Twitter um, plugin so that this person would then start tweeting bits about dog fashion and what have you. So that kind of looked like this. You'd find there's plenty of groups that will talk about dog fashion on Flickr, and that was one of the images. It then goes into a WordPress site, and then eventually it turns up into a tweet uh, with a new blog post on a technical a dream sweater. And they could be all sorts of inane sort of posts, which you might not expect an old lady to be tweeting. The next thing we did was used a, a, an online tool called a If This Then That. Uh, and in this context, it said, okay, if the temperature rises above 20 degrees C in uh, part of the UK, Bournemouth, then tweet, obviously, to the user's name. Not That's my Twitter handle. Um, so she'd then tweet, oh, wonderful, I can switch the heating off. It's 15 degrees C and sunny in Bournemouth. Get in. So that would happen then every time the temperature rose above that um, above that. So it was a neat way of actually generating some content without having to do anything. Then the next thing we did is we took uh, the target list of 305 per bot and we followed them. You have to do some work with the way that you follow people because the Twitter rules mandate that you don't do like aggressive following. So it takes a little while to do that following. Um, then if they respond, 
we wanted to collect that in a CSV file just with interactions with things like when they responded and who they were and stuff like that. From there then we'd start tweeting pretty much random nonsense and the random nonsense was, was taken almost identically from the web ecology project but with a few little additions that just you know amused us. So for example this was one of the tweets uh, for our old lady. I ain't telling no lies even a thug lady cries but I show no fears I cry gangster tears. I, I, probably works better after a beer but that was one of the tweets which is kind of different to what you'd expect from an old lady. Um, so we're, there were clues that this person might not be real. Too cute my dog is I talk like Yoda. Um, it was a whole bunch of tweets essentially a little bit like that but she would only tweet those maybe four or five times a day but there was a whole bunch that she, sh she could uh, select from. Then, um, oh this was a, yeah, another example. So my dog is adorable, I swear he barks sausages. So then what we did in the same way that the Web Ecology Project did, we started asking questions of each of the users that we'd followed as long as we hadn't been blocked. And we had a pool of 162 questions which we duplicated so it'd go through and ask those questions, you know, get to the end of the questions. And the questions were also fairly inane like ever milked a cow? Um, and what's better, a dog or a cat? And these would actually generate some responses which was pretty interesting. And then this was where we varied or differed from the Web Ecology Project. They had just a stock bunch of responses but we added like an ELISA uh, engine onto the uh, Python script that we'd written which would hopefully make some of the responses a bit more appropriate. So some of the responses would be like, hello, um, hey, how's your day going so far? Fairly, fairly legitimate um, but we wanted to add some fun into that as well so sometimes if a user would say I think, we'd respond with ah, interesting or lol, that's what she said and that could be kind of at random. There were a bunch of things that they could respond with. Um, and that, that mainly gave us some amusement. The other thing we had to consider though was the concept of ethics because one of the things that we wanted to do um, in order to sort of keep in line with ethics is make sure we didn't upset anybody and this was from the social, uh, social bots competition where they, they called this out. Do you have any pets if so what? Um, your Avi is adorable, your kitty. No I don't currently have any pets since my kitty passed away a few years ago to which their bot responded lol that rules. So we didn't really, <laughs> we, ne we needed to avoid that because that was probably crossing the boundaries of ethics. So if you mention ethics to anybody who like studies social bots they'll probably smile with a similar story. Um, so there are a number of limitations which you're probably all thinking about. We had basic me measures of personality. So fairly crude. It was a basic social bot. Uh, each user got a different question and as the uh, experiment progressed the bots would have uh, obviously more interaction online so maybe they became more credible or less credible. Who knows? And also there was no user follow up at the end so we don't know whether users cared whether it was a social bot but knew or not. So these are a number of the limitations I just wanted to get out there you know, from the, from the bat. So what did we find from this? Well we got a 20% response rate which is worse than the Web Ecology Project but there are a number of reasons why that could be. Uh, but we found that we got um, 124 uh, interactions of some sort broken down with like um, 39 follow backs and 85 uh, replies and out of those replies some people would reply and actually converse a lot more with the social bot and some of the, some of the com conversations were actually pretty funny. Um, in terms of performance that's kind of how it stacks up with the Aerofade bot from the Web Ecology Project. You can see that ours did uh, you know, a lot worse which is fine. But one of the amusing things is that the bot would often get into sort of unintended trolling. So um, you get a user, this is one of the questions, using more, no more than 10 nouns and only nouns describe yourself. Facetious, I blanked out the swear words um, but it was four letters. Um, annoying. So that was kind of a, a, amusing to us and then the bot would respond, how do you feel when you say that? Which was from the ELISA engine which amused me. The next thing was um, an interaction with a particular user, it's a cool story bro, shut up I hope you get suspended to which the bot responds, I'm laughing so hard right now. <laughs> I'm not sure if the user actually saw that because they may have already blocked the bot by then, I don't know. And 
We also got outed as being a social bot as well. What do you do for a living? I plan, guide, and help others write stuff. Uh, you're right, and when you're right, you're right, which was a stock response from the Web Ecology Project. You're a bot, aren't you? Granny failing Turing test after one exchange. So these kind of things amuse us. So what did we find from the personality uh, aspect? Well, looking at that, we saw that extroversion was the only personality trait out of all of the big five and the three dark triad traits that had a statistically significant um, uh, relationship. So that's not necessarily that surprising, um, I guess, because extroverts are, would tend to gravitate towards social engagement and maybe not care too much because some elements of extroversion may be related to uh, impulsivity. And this is another way of describing it. So you can see that as extroversion gets really high at one end of the scale, it kind of escapes and your probability of an interaction goes to like 0.4 rather than 0.2. Uh, clout score was also statistically significant. Friends, or the friend count, and uh, uh, was that friends? Friends, this one's followers, sorry, wrong title. So what, you might well say. Um, well, e-learning, for example, if you work in a corporation, e-learning tends to be uh, one size fits all. And if it's e-learning one size fits all, the people that that's going to fit the best are going to be introverts because they've got least control over the learning experience. And there's some papers that are referenced in the notes about this as well. So the very people that need to be more aware of social bots and interaction with like phishing are probably the people that are going to get the least out of e-learning. So it raises some question about do you find people in your sales organization, for example, and you know, do, some, do some more in-depth in, in face-to-face face, face -face sort of training? So we'll move on to talk about the data mining and machine learning. This is where we switch to can we predict who's going to respond and who, who isn't. Uh, you know, improve the odds, essentially, of getting a response. So this was what our baseline uh, performance looked like. About 20% of the, uh, the, the population responded. And what we wanted to do is obviously uh, reduce this bit because the more of those there are, then the more likely you are to end up with, with that screen. Um, so you want to try and reduce, improve the odds in your favor essentially and add, end, up, end up with something like this where you've got all of the true positives who are going to respond and make sure you find all of the true negatives. So that would be you know, essentially perfection. So at this point, just want to call out um, precision as one of the performance um, evaluation criteria really. What we deal with in precision is looking at the retrieved, uh, the retrieved part of the data set. So we're not interested in the not retrieved stuff. And uh, precision is really the fraction of retrieved instances that were correct. So in this case it was about 20%. 20 um, and that's what we wanted to improve. So at this point now, I'm going to hand over to my uh, co-speaker here, Dr. Randall Wald from the University of uh, Florida Atlantic University, rather. As um, Chris Sumner was saying, I am Dr. Randall Wald from Florida Atlantic University. My primary focus is on data mining, machine learning, basically data science. So let me give some very basic background on what data science is. It's a, important for a lot of different fields, including security research and, in this case, social botch mining and related um, social research. But some of you may not be as familiar with it. So this is just an example of what a data set might look like with, you know, columns and rows. And specifically, each row here is an instance which has a label and it has a class value and it has various feature values. So the feature values are Piece of, pieces of information we know about these people that we can acquire independent of the problem we're looking at. So in the case of Twitter, this is information we can find out about the person before we interact with them, before we see what they're actually going to do. So this is, for example, clout score or number of friends where we can determine that just by looking at a profile and not having to um, work with that person directly. While whether or not they interact with the bot, that is the class of interest. That's what we want to learn about the person. And the goal of our, the, the data science here is to use the features, use the independent attributes in order to determine the class. This basically involves building different types of models that will take, use the instances we already have, use the data we collected during the training phase, 
and try to use that to help us understand which features can imp imply about the actual class values. And note also that, of course, the ID column is removed because that's not going to help you in building models. Basically, we want to build models that can use the features to predict the class. And there are different ways to try to evaluate this. Like I said, if you have training data and you want to predict test data, this is one way to look at it. For example, this is particularly if you have a large training set, then you're going to be able to take that training set, cut out most of it, use that for training, and then verify your model on the test data set. In practice, obviously, when you have a new unidentified instance, you can't tell if your model worked or not because you don't have the true value there. But to evaluate the model when doing research, you need to have the, the known ground truth, and therefore you have a test data set to test with. Alternately, if you have a relatively small data set, as we do here, we have 610 instances, you can't always afford to just take some, only train your model on some of them. So what you can actually do is break your data set into K, in this case usually 10 is a good number, of folds, train on 9 tenths of the data, and test on the last tenth of the data. And then you repeat this 10 times so you get a good uh, sense of how well your model can perform and you're making sure that you never are looking at the performance of the model when it's trained on the same instances. This is a known issue. If you have a model and you train it on some instances and then you say how well does it perform on those instances, you're going to get a good performance but that's not necessarily very meaningful because you're obviously the model could memorize those instances and not really do anything useful for you. So by using these techniques we can make sure that the models are never tested on the same instances they were trained with. Now when it comes to different models, I, I say models very broadly and you probably are wondering what, what do you mean? Do you mean a, like a decision tree? Do you mean some sort of statistical regression? And there are actually many different choices here. And the thing with data mining is it's no one best choice. You'd like to say, oh, this choice makes a lot of intuitive sense. Why don't we always use that? Because there are a dozen different models that you could always say in some sense that's the most intuitive one, that's the one you want to go with. So in order to find the best model, really the only option is to test a bunch of different options and on your given data set and see what works best. Data science is not an exact science. It's basically seeing what works on real data because real data is weird. Real data has complicated things and you can never be certain what's going to happen until you actually experiment with it. So when you want to see how well your model worked on real data, one important thing to keep in mind is you may not have balanced data. And what that means is you may have more instances in one class than another. As Chris was saying, in this case, most people were not interacting or applying with the social bots. I m believe that only 20% of individuals interacted in any fashion whatsoever, while only 13% replied. And if you just take a simple performance metric like accuracy, like what fraction of individuals that I classify correctly, that can be very misleading on such data sets. For example, you could just say, I predict no one interacted. And you're correct 80% of the time, but your model is useless. So in our research we use different metrics such as the area under the ROC curve, abbreviated AUC, which try to give a more balanced view of false positives and false negatives to see how that our models are not just giving us, you know, a naive view and saying, oh, you got all the negative ones correct, doesn't that count for something? You want a model that can balance both false positives and false negatives. So I noted that we had multiple features. In the little diagram I only showed two, but in practice we have quite a few in this data set. The um, tool used to extract information from the tweets give us 80 different features for each tweet, for each user telling about how they use different language terms, different words, different semantics, different punctuation. And we actually divided the tweets into different categories so we had even more. So we, we, in order to build more accurate models and more meaningful models, we wanted to figure out which features are most important. This is especially interesting in the con context of this Twitter social mining in that we don't care necessarily about all the features. We care about which features are most important for understanding how users interact with bots. Which traits of an individual 
are going to tell us where, whether they're going to interact or reply. So feature selection will go through all the features and rank them and say these features are the most important and these are the features that you need to use for building models and also these are the features you want to use if you want to understand the psychology, the mental processes that lead to individuals interacting or replying to social bots. So we employ these techniques to try to get a better sense of how these features directly relate to the class, in this case interaction or reply with social bots. So we perform two sort of several types of experiments here on this data. The first was trying to identify the top features. And this in particular what we did was we took a number of different approaches for feature selection because as with classification there are many different options you can use all of which seem intuitive on their own and without data you don't know which one is best. So we wanted to find features that were actually reliable and good across many different feature selection techniques. That tells us that feature is really meaningful, that all these different approaches all say this feature is important for the data set. So we wanted to look at the features that ranked highly and say that these features are those that are relevant to our problem. And then once we found the most important features, we built classification models to say can we predict based solely on the feature values, based solely on the independent information we have about these users from their um, Twitter accounts and their profiles, can we use these features to predict whether they're going to interact with or reply to a social bot? So let's go over. The tool we use primarily for this is Weka, it's from the Waikato, University of Waikato in New Zealand, open source tool available for all major computing platforms, it's written in Java, has um, GUI interface, though these experiments were performed using the command line interface, which is why I'm not showing you the interface because it's just, you know, typing in the command line and it's not particularly graphically interesting. But Weka is a very powerful tool for data mining. We've written a few extensions to add additional tools to it. But it, it lets you perform a lot of very interesting um, experiments trying to um, do feature selection and classification on different types of data sets. So this I'm going to go over it quickly. This is the interactive data set, uh, the rank of the different features. Most important are the top three which were um, clout score, friend count and followers count or I'm going to pull those out here. So these are the th three features that are most relevant for whether or not a user interacted with the bot. In particular, the clout score was the most relevant. The people with higher clout scores were more likely to interact with the bot and this was the strongest correlation of any of the features. And then friends count and followers count were second and third place. So this shows us that users that have more friends are more likely to interact to, or with the bot in some fashion, in, with friends or followers. Now what's interesting is the reply results are a little different. We still see clout score at the top here, but instead of the second place is no longer friends count or followers count. Those are down here and here. Instead, percent follow Friday comes higher. So it's actually interesting. We see that there are different personality traits that lead to either interacting with social bots or replying specifically. That those who interact with social bots are, those, are more likely to have the more connections, more friends and, and followers on Twitter, while those who actually interact are more likely to be involved in the Follow Friday um, tradition, i.e., trying to encourage users to learn about new individuals. So I found that extremely interesting that even though these sound like two very similar classes that we have, you know, people who, who interact with social bots or people who reply to them, there actually are meaningful differences here in that those who interact are more likely to have more friends while those who reply are more likely to be in actively engaged in the Follow Friday tradition. Now, following building the, the so following using the features to determine the top features, we built our classification models and these are just a bunch of models we built. I'm just going to highlight the best model we have here was when you used um, top 40 features, select using a technique, don't worry about the name of the technique. Um, and we found that using this we were able to build a model that had a true positive rate of 0 0.6130 et cetera percent and a, a true negative rate of um, 0 0.707 uh, value. So to put that in perspective, this is the number of individuals in our true positive, uh, false positive, true, ne true negative and false negatives. Now looking at this you're going to say, so you're telling me that 
true positives are still outweighed by false positives. And yes, this is true. Our models, if you, our models tell you an individual is going to interact with, with the bot, it still is frankly more likely than not that they're not because 87, 87 of those individuals are true positives but 188 are false positives. However, compare that with the gray outlines which would be if you just guessed that everyone is going to interact with the bot. Here we see that we are having a significant improvement over the raw model of just trying to send the, the bot in track with everyone. So going out with what Chris was saying earlier is that if we want to minimize the chance that our bot is going to be detected, that our bot is going to be, if someone is going to say, oh, that's a bot, flag for a deletion, we want to reduce the number of false positives while trying to not harm the true positives as much as we can. So we're not expecting perfection here. We're not going to pinpoint with laser accuracy all the individuals who are going to interact with the bot and pick up none of those who will, will not interact. All we want to do is improve the odds, make it more likely that the individuals we target are the individuals we want to target. Now we did similar work with the data set looking at only those who replied specifically. We found that it's a little harder to determine individuals that will reply and not just um, interact. We found that it, it performance was a little bit less. Our top model only gave a true positive rate of 58.58 um, and a true negative rate of 0.73. And it's just a, I also found that different techniques worked well on this compared to the replied, the interactive data set. This goes back to what I was saying earlier. You have all these different algorithms. You have different classification models. You have different feature selection techniques. You can't just say one of these is going to always be your best bet. Because even on these two data sets that are very similar, the only thing differs is whether the users were interacting with the bot or replying to the bot. Even these very similar data sets, different techniques performed well on these two data sets. So it shows the importance of considering different techniques and making sure you experiment and see what's going to actually work best on your real world data. And the overall results, similar type of procedure here, we see that our true positive is 89 individuals, our false positive was 202 individuals, which again, we're still getting more false positives than true positives, but since we had many more individuals in the negative class, this is not entirely surprising and all we're trying to do here is improve the odds, make it such that we will have a better chance of getting the individuals we want even though we know we're not going to be perfect here. We know we're not building a, a you know, 100% accurate model but we're going to build a model that will make our bots survive longer and will let us find more of the users we care about. So overall just the discussion is that the data sets had different um, properties and it's just is interesting and shows that you need to look your experiments on different models but we're able to build models that could help us find the individuals we want more reliably than just trying to guess everyone and hope that we're getting people we want to find. So with that, and uh, what's the performance saying that one of the reasons we feel that we had worse performance on the replied data set was that there were fewer individuals who replied to the bot compared to those who interacted with it. So that led us to say that it's a little harder to understand those individuals because there are fewer of them and you're more likely to get uh, false positives because there are just so many negative individuals that you're going to find more of them overall. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Chris to wrap up the talk and give some conclusions. Okay, so we'll um, just spend the next five minutes wrap up the, uh, the the talk here. So we found that extroverts were essentially at greater risk than introverts from interacting with a social a social bot, possibly phishing as well. Um, there were some differences between the two data sets as well, but there's surprisingly little overlap, and that could be because people had like maybe automated follow back set up or just followed people back willy nilly. But in terms of interacting, a lot less. Um, we concluded really that models could help bot masters or those wanting to do that uh, to find susceptible uh, individuals, or at least reduce the chance of finding people who aren't going to respond. And in terms of why we think that's uh, important or worthy is that 
marketeers have definitely got skin in the game of trying to get more engagement, so it would behoove them to actually go try and find people who are more likely to respond. Uh, the propagandists may well want to focus on people who are more likely to uh, push their message further out. Social engineers can at least reduce the chance of hitting people who are less likely to respond, um, maybe. And in terms of um, how would social network providers respond, well, there's a couple of ways that this could be, or, or this whole field could be used for. One is in the field of usable security. So in terms of the web browser context, you know, this is kind of, you, you hit on something that's got a certification problem and you're going to get a red bar rather than a green bar and, you know, so on. So that concept may, there may be some version of that concept that could apply into social networks as well, I don't know, um, but it's, it's a possibility, as long as it doesn't end up like this, if anybody remembers old Windows helpful icons. So... Um, the other area, and I think the area where I think there's like most potential straight away really, is in actually thinking about your training classes and like looking or understanding that a certain portion of your users are going to be very different to another portion. So, for example, sales, which you might be maybe more uh, extroverted than, say, the accounts department, maybe you give them sort of face to face training on sort of phishing awareness, but also they may be uh, more susceptible in the first place. I'm aware that I'm interchanging phishing with social bots but at some point the two kind of converge a little and in terms of future research um, one of the things you know we looked we had the two questions that were associated with extroversion where you could look a lot deeper into um, the big five factors so you could look a lot deeper into extroversion look at the facets of that especially the facets related with impulsivity um, and for impulsivity, maybe you could actually look at the, using the cognitive reflective, uh, reflective test, which essentially you can try this out now for yourselves, is a bat and a ball cost $1.10 in total, and a bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? People who are more um, impulsive are going to answer that wrong more often. So there's some interesting studies on that, and that might be something which future researchers could do in, in looking at response rates to phishing and to uh, social bots. And finally, you know, our, our bot was really crude. We, you know, we literally took the web ecology bot, modified it very slightly, kept in the same spirit of its banality, if you like, um, and really didn't do anything special. But you could go for a much more target-centric approach where uh, you're focusing on certain users and you're having your bot talk in a very bot you know, in a, in a meaningful way to that particular audience rather than just being very generic. Uh, the final thing I wanted to mention is that it's not all bad, really. Um, there's a chap called Lutz Finger, if I don't know if folks are aware of him, he does a lot of sort of work on sort of data science, social media and what have you. And he was talking um, at a conference, the Strata conference earlier this year, and he said, um, the uh, dating site OKCupid had a problem with fake accounts. So what they did is they created this sort of identical environment to OKCupid, but essentially it was uh, only had bot profiles. So when bots came into the real OKCupid site, they transferred them into this identical looking part of OKCupid, which was essentially bots talking and trying to date other bots. So um, that I have not, that's kind of allegedly, you know, I've not, I've not found any evidence that OKCupid okay actually do that, but it's kind of, it's kind of amusing that that's how they're, they're responding. So in, in wrapping up then, the, um, the paper I mentioned earlier, Ruloff and uh, Kenneth Gears, really uh, this still seems pretty true today that illustrations from the Turing test and Blade Runner suggest that sufficient interactive interactivity with a computer should reveal that it's not human. In some cases, people identified that we were a bot pretty, uh, pretty quickly. So with that, we uh, conclude the, uh, the presentation. If anybody's got any questions, happy to try and answer them now. So was there any attempt? Uh, 
Okay, so the question was really, did we try and parse the replies from the users and base the responses that the bot made uh, based on those replies? And the answer to that is no, really. We're essentially, the, the closest we got to that is we, we had an Eliza engine that would actually parse and see if you said things like I think or uh, hello or something like that and would then have a, a number of canned responses that it could send. But in terms of anything smart, it was really pretty dumb. I don't know if that answers the, the question, but in terms of future research, I think there's a lot of mileage if you're looking at social bots into actually developing that, which looks at previous tweets, previous interactions of a user, and then basing your responses on, on that. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's, it's just that I, I feel like you can't really base those conclusions that extroverted people are more likely to respond to social media than introverted people. Because if Unless there's a second response or a third response or you're interpreting those things, I think you're just taking like a linear, uh, you know, basically a, four, a first order approximation of, uh, of your responses. But so, so when someone responds with, you know, the Turing test failed, uh, right, is that is that included in the, the the statistic where someone did reply to the lot? That was included as a response, yeah, because the initial response was, didn't that it was a real response. after the second response, I think. The first response they actually answered appropriately. Okay. And then in the second response, when the bot then responded in a, in, a, in a dumb way, then they didn't respond further. So, and essentially to address the, you know, the, the other point is that uh, research on social bots, the, the only other paper that's looked at research on social bots on Twitter was by Wagner et al. in 2012, which took the findings of the social bots competition and used that to like identify. So um, we'd, I guess, like to state that it's a really small piece of research that we're doing here, which is scraping the surface and hopefully the intent is if people are looking at personality and user behavior, maybe the findings we've got in terms of extroversion would get people maybe thinking about, okay, well, maybe it's broader than extroversion or I need to look deeper into extroversion and those traits and design the next experiment accordingly, maybe look at impulsivity. So we're aware of the if you like, the great limitations of, of what we're doing. But it's, those are good points, actually, about the reply. And we did think about that you know, quite a lot. But then we were like, actually, they did respond once. And it was only when we responded to their response that, you know, still, good, good point. Gentleman at the back. Uh, because the you well okay so you can never be a hundred percent sure right but the users that had, um, the users that we took were users that had already signed up to a personality test where they'd have to do a couple of things they'd have to go through a consent form and then add the the application um, and then fill out um, it was like ten questions for the big five personality traits and then 29 for the dark triad. So they'd have had to go through that. Now, yeah, you could automate it, but I'm not sure who would actually want to do that. So, I mean, I think the, the possibility of that is pretty low. Jen, yep. Yeah, there's a good reason for that. When we, um, when we handed over the data to Randall, we, Randall's task really and that their group were to look at how do you predict, you know, you wouldn't find the personality data on Twitter, it's not a Twitter attribute. So we looked at what tw Twitter attributes and Twitter activity would enable us to maybe gain an advantage in terms of the social bot, whereas extroversion was just something we were interested in, in sort of correlation, if you like. So we didn't say, oh, do we know that a user is extroverted and how would that work? Yep. Well, one thing I'd like to add is that, as Chris was saying, basically for the, the, the machine learning aspect, our concept was that in practice a model would, 
you're not going to have personality um, profiles of these people. We have them because of the previous um, psychopath psychopathy research. But in, in reality, if you're a marketer, you're you know a, someone out there trying to find individuals to target for this. You don't have that information. The best you're going to have is clout score, and I feel clout score might have some correlation with um, extroversion. I think. Did we find that? I can't recall actually off the top of my head. I I, I would not be surprised to learn that there is a correlation there. So I, that, that sort of acts as a proxy a little bit. It obviously it's not the same, but I, that's they're giving us the same idea. And yes, we for considered looking at the way the personality traits directly could help build our models, but the concern there was that they would totally overwhelm the rest of the features and then it wouldn't help us understand the actual Twitter features that are really contributing to whether an individual replies or interacts with the bot. Hope that answers your question. See, right no, we didn't have we didn't have any other um, you know information. So IQ would have been an interesting one. I mean, I think the whole area of social bot research and susceptibility not just to bots but to phishing emails, I think, is a fascinating area for people who are able to move beyond the ethics issues. You know, with, with that. But IQ, impulsivity, personality, all of those, I think, have got some underlying. Um, value, if you like, or utility to how people respond. But it could also be that people respond differently on different days depending on how they're feeling. So, you know, it's really nascent research, and our objective was just to have a bit of a look. But does that, I guess, that answers the question. Any other questions? All right, well, I really appreciate you guys sticking around. And, uh, and coming to see us. And on another note, I would actually really appreciate feedback. I'm my own worst critic, but um, very happy to, to receive any feedback. So if you wave your badges at whatever it is you need to wave them at, that would be much appreciated. Thanks very much.